Join us, friends. Great Scott, smart guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, smart guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the spa guy, and it is... A little trotting with Shree. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there are a lot of people that are. And some of you probably are. So, hey, I guarantee you, some of the people listening or watching right now are wishing Cotton was a monkey. I hope you not. Don't... I hope, <laughs> not. No, I hope not, too. But we live in a fake world, sadly where everybody pretends to be something that they're not or to like something that they don't really just yeah. to go along to get along. I hey, refuse I, to do I, that. Before we get to the show, have you shopped at Target lately? Not going to. You know, I quit Target when they started trying to let people go into, you know, switching bathrooms up and stuff. I was out that day. Oh, so I think that they're going <laughs> to, I think they're going to find that, um, you know, what we're seeing here is, these corporations that are uh, being fake about what they really, how they really feel and pretending like they feel another way, but the public is voting. I'll just say that. So the public is telling you what's really up. All those people can pretend, but that's an aside. I'm sorry, uh, David, let's bring David in. And uh, he probably doesn't want to come in now that I've uh, opened that can of worms. He was going so, so <laughs> he'll go ahead and pray for us. So friends, this is David Gould and uh, David is my right hand man at the spa guy. He was on a previous episode where he talked about going to Kenya and preaching in Kenya in, uh, in Africa and in the Africa, you remember uh, that <laughs> and the Iraq and the such as. And so uh, David likes to laugh and likes to joke. Trey likes to laugh and joke. So we can do some of that in this. Uh, I think that'll be fun. But uh, we want to talk about several different things with you, David. First, me and you both grew up in eastern North Carolina. Where you grew up was uh, Moorhead City, which we I would go to Moorhead City as a kid. So I spent a lot of time at Atlantic Beach, Moorhead, Beaufort, um, uh, Emerald Isle, that whole area. Because for us, that was really close to our house. And I would go um, as a teenager, junior, senior weekend was always in Atlantic Beach. Um, my dad would go, uh, he loved to go floundering or go uh, 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 fishing on the piers. My wife's dad would love to go fishing on the piers. And we would eat at Sanitary Fish House in Moorhead City. I played music in Beaufort. I played music in, uh, in Atlantic Beach. So I just have a lot of fond memories of those areas. And tell us some of your fond memories. Sanitary Fish House is a, uh, I actually went there the, the last time I was in North Carolina this past December, and I, I couldn't remember how it looked. It's very modern looking. I don't remember it looking that modern. It, did it change? <laughs> Everybody gets a little update every now and then. Yeah, I guess so. It's <laughs> yeah. one of those things where they back the fishing boats up. They go out and fresh catch back up and yes. literally sell the fish to the sanitary fish house, or I think you can go there and buy fish That's off right. the boats and that kind of stuff. So it's pretty amazing. Yes, sir. Yeah, my family uh, for generations, several generations before me, uh, were uh, charter fishermen, commercial fishermen. Uh, and so some of those boat slips that you would walk by right next to Captain Bill's on your way to Sanitary, some of those were from my family members. Uh, I have a cousin now. He owns uh, the uh, Carolina Princess. He's the captain of the owner of Carolina Princess. And that's, uh, that's a deep sea fishing boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you're ever down there, check that out. Uh, but so that was our family's history right there. And of course, um, generation after generation would catch fish. And that's that's a whole different lifestyle where you get up super early and you go out and you take people out and they pay you a lot of money to take them to catch fish. So you really hope they catch fish. And then yeah. uh, my father, he he went into the pastoral ministry and kind of broke that line a little bit. And we well, all uh, still fishers, just fishers of men. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. You got it. He just, <laughs> he just Jesus juked that right there. So, uh, so yeah. So, but I love Moorhead. Moorhead, you know, back in the day, and I, I feel old when I say that, but it was Mayberry, basically, like like your area was. Yeah. Uh, and I grew up there, and man, I remember when we would have our phone numbers. You would not have to type out the whole phone number. You could type out like the 
if it was seven two six nine three one one was our local number, you could just type six nine three one one, and you would get the number. I mean, that's just that is just one little thing about how it was, man. I love that place. And uh, going back now, obviously it's a tourist area, and and I understand that too. But uh, grew up on the Outer Banks. My father passed three churches out there, so I was a little kid growing up on the Outer Banks. And, well, you got to be able to pawn off of one of your kids to go spend a vacation on the Outer Banks these days. But uh, just a beautiful area down home and uh, loved it. So is that close to Manio? Uh, yeah. So the Outer Banks, um, I was out there maybe last year, a couple of years ago in Nags Head, and that's right across the sound from Manio. And so. Uh, Andy Griffith lived. Yes. Yes, indeed. Matter of fact, when I was a baby, we were, my, my mom tells a story of she was in the grocery store with me and she was in one, one lane of the little village uh, grocery market. And she heard somebody that was really loud, just really loud, a few aisles over. And it turns out it was Andy Griffith. I was, it was probably like 1971, somewhere in there. And uh, she, she kind of looked around. It was Andy Griffith over there because he spent a lot of time in that area. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, good time. That was his stomping ground yeah, down in there. Was. Yeah, yeah, because he was he was part of the lost colony, you know, uh, just a great talent, obviously. And every pretty much everything he did, he was really good at, obviously. But um, I've been to the lost colony performance, and it was very, very impressive. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. So yeah, yeah, I had been as well. You remember I talked about my mother, uh, her, her boyfriend, one of her boyfriends, way, and I'm talking about way back when I was a kid did Andy Griffiths part at the, uh, at the uh, lost colony yeah. play. And for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, it was a, it's a ongoing, I assume it's still going on now. It's been it going on forever that Andy Griffith played the lead role. He played Sir Walter Raleigh, right? That's right. And, yeah. um, and so uh, what was it that they carved in the tree? Was it Croatoa? Am I remembering yeah. that right? And okay. uh, Croatoa was part of, that was part of the yeah. play. But it was a play about what, what the first settlers uh, yeah. to that area or something of that. Yeah, and they disappeared. They're called. That's why they call it the Lost Colony. Yeah, they disappeared, and there was basically no record of what happened to them. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a cool play, right there, it's on, the, a, right there on the ocean. Yeah, yeah, and it's a wild play. I mean, there's a lot of there's a yes. lot of calabash type stuff and that's right. sword fighting awesome. and stuff. It's, yeah. yeah, I remember it being really really cool. Yeah, it's worth going to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to go and, and, and see that one day, you know, because that's how Andy got his start as an actor, pretty much. And he yep. fell in love with that area, and he's buried there today uh, yeah. uh, in Manio. So. And, and incidentally, the way he ended up there was him teaching at a high school in Goldsboro, which if I'm leaving, uh, it would be the opposite way from where I live going to Moorhead City. So if you were coming from Moorhead back to the town I lived in, Kinston, and then you went to Goldsboro, headed towards Raleigh. That's where Andy Griffith taught high school. And the guy that was there uh, that uh, was over the drama department in that high school had something to do with the Lost Colony play. So he got Andy to go do that. All that stuff is tied together, uh, which is very, very yeah. interesting. And it, it all ties back to him teaching at that high school. Yeah. And that's uh, I think that was 48, 49. So that's yeah. that goes back to the forties. That's crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. years before Andy Griffith's show. Yeah, before that's even thought about. Right. Yeah. Well, that that whole area is rich with history. Obviously, you have Tryon Palace in Newburn, uh, which is a palace where the governor. Uh, and this is like before North Carolina was really even a, a thing. Uh, but also, like people like uh, Walter Cronkite, for instance, he would bring his. He would be going from uh, New York City down to Florida, and he would stop in Beaufort, and he would put his. Uh, yacht there and he would go into town and eat so it's a good place for that as well so yeah and for all you south carolinians y'all are saying it wrong it's not beaufort it's although it's spelled the same it is yeah. beaufort north carolina um right. and i actually have a little history in beaufort north carolina and that is uh <laughs> this is going to be slightly off color but not enough to embarrass you david but uh, we played music and I cannot, it's been so long ago. I went to Beaufort recently, as I mentioned, and tried to remember where this place was that we played music. But I had a friend that we ran, uh, when we were not playing at this little club, uh, we would go run sound for other bands. So we would get paid to provide PA for these other bands. It was me and a guy named Hardy Weatherington. Hardy's from Greenville, North Carolina. 
Um, and he plays in a group now called Swimming with Sharks. And they go out and do a lot of stuff around Eastern North Carolina. So Hardy and I had this uh, little sound company and we would go there. And Hardy was in the back alley behind this place one night. And he didn't want to take the time to go to the bathroom in this little venue. So he relieved himself. Uh, and I'll clean up the, the punchline to this joke. Um, and we made $100 is what we charged to run sound. I would get $50. He would get $50. That night, he got a ticket for $50 for peeing in the alley. And I told him he was the only person that I knew that had literally peed $50 away. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> and I cleaned it up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and then next to the venue that we played out there in Beaufort, was one of the village people ran, it was a little store and one of the original members of the village people, and I can't tell you who it was, but that was that person's store. And it was right next, the two venues were next door to each other. And uh, so I'm just talking off the top of my head, but yeah. that's something that I remember from that. And I haven't yeah. been to Beaufort until recently in probably in 30 years. It's been a long, long time ago. So yeah. you can find that alley. I, well, I drove around and I, I found a place that I thought looked like it, but man, that was 30 years ago, you so know, yeah. and, and it may have been longer. It might've been 40 years ago. I don't know. You know, time, it can't be 40 because I wasn't old enough, but it was probably 35 years ago. That was before I was playing country music where I was playing college rock. So that would have been the early, late eighties, early nineties. Now, well, that, now I'm telling you wrong. That would have been the mid eighties. Because yeah. I started doing country music about 89 or 90. So, so wow, what a long time ago. <laughs> and time years. flies. It was 40 years then. Yeah, years. so that was before you were born, wasn't it? 1987. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, that would have been mid-80s. 80s. I got married in 1987. I've been married as long as you've been alive. Oh, man. Um. So, David, um, some other things that I wanted to ask you about was you didn't always live in Moorhead, but that's, that's right. we kind of associate because we were both from that area. I'm from Raleigh originally, yeah. but I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. We grew up, grew up very close together, but you ended up living in a lot of other places, Knoxville, Tennessee being one of them, which is UT basketball, University of Tennessee. My daughter and uh, my son-in-law both graduated from UT and uh, Trey has a basketball heritage. David has a basketball heritage. So tell us about that. You actually did something with the basketball team there. Did you, were you all American one year? Well, I'm always all American. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I like Swiss or Provolone, but usually I'm yeah. all American. <laughs> Why uh, can't yeah. you here with David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, open mic. All right. So, yeah. Um, so I would, I would actually go down. I enjoyed going down to the ball games and, uh, there are ways or were ways that you could get in the football games and basketball games for free uh, if you were willing to sell programs, things like that. So I started doing that and I would take my son with me. He was just a little boy and uh, I would sell programs. So I would make money selling the programs and they would give you a voucher to walk into the football games and basketball games. I ended up selling merch at Thompson Bowling Arena uh, for, uh, you know, monster truck shows and all that. But I was getting into the venue and I was able to see everything and get paid while I was there. Uh, so I, I was during the Jerry Green years, uh, his last year, uh, he was down there coaching and I went down and, and I just happened to, to go up to him and I asked him if they had a um, anybody who did prayer uh, with the team or had a Bible study with the team. And uh, he said, no, he wasn't really interested in that. Said, okay. So then the next year, uh, Buzz Peterson comes in and he takes the team. Buzz, uh, you know, he was a roommate with Michael Jordan uh, back in the day, way from North Carolina. I was in North Carolina then. Yeah. I so, uh, and I, uh, Buzz, like me, I, I met him in the party. Real cool guy. Oh, really? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really is. Really is. And just so laid back, too, you know, uh, for being at that that level of uh, And did he walk on the moon? Uh, that was, well, no, that was his, uh, that was the other Buzz. That was, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. But it was, it's kind of like, yeah. Kind of. I mean, Michael Jordan could walk on the moon. He could take off at the free throw line and walk on the moon. Right. But uh, um, with, Buzz Buzz, Aldrin, with Buzz, Billy. 
Buzz was an all like all American, like the top player in the state of North Carolina. Was Mr. Basketball, yeah. And Michael Jordan was in North Carolina. So Mike uh he got a scholarship to North University of North Carolina. MJ got a scholarship there. They were roommates. But Buzz didn't know that it was also motivation to Michael. Even though they were best friends and roommates, Michael always felt that he was a better player than Buzz. But Buzz was Mr. Basketball and everything until college basketball season started and Michael started playing. And uh, But uh, Michael talked about Buzz in his Hall of Fame speech, even though they're still best friends. And probably the first time ever Buzz heard that, you know, I thought I was better than you, dude. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Right. You know? Yeah. So, back david to, to, so that uh, was it gave him something to uh to compete for. michael was all about motivation and that's what made him so great he always took stuff to motivate himself to be better so if it was a person that hey i gotta be better than the spa guy that mm-hmm. motivated michael to be better than you and that's mm-hmm. why he is who he is yeah good luck with that michael jordan <laughs> hey that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if he stays with it, someday he'll make something out of it. Maybe. <laughs> oh, that's my guy, the know all of all history. <laughs> I read that yeah. all the time, spy guy. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, I know everything. Uh, Buzz Peterson was actually uh, recruited uh, by the University of Kentucky as well. That's how that's how high level he was coming out of Asheville uh, as a college, you know, going into the college uh, ranks. But uh, he came in to coach Tennessee. And um, I went down, it was like right before Christmas. It was, uh, he had just done his after, his post-game radio show, and I waited. And as he was walking away, I asked him, I said, do you have anybody to come and pray with your team on game day or anything like that? And he said, no. He said, uh, talk to talk to Chris, one of the assistant coaches. And so I talked to Chris, and uh, he had me come in after the, after the holiday break. Came in, just went in and gave a few words of encouragement and prayed with the team in the locker room. And, uh, you know, they all went out on the court, and I was one of the last ones to come out. And Chris was standing there at the door. And I said, man, I hope that was good. He goes, uh, yeah, absolutely. He said, you want to come back? And I'm like, hmm, yeah, <laughs> I would love to come back. And uh, it became an open-door policy. And uh, it was just a volunteer work. But it came to a point where I wasn't just doing prayer with the team before, before the games, but we would have Bible studies. Like I would have a Sunday Bible study and, and quite a few of the guys would show up. It was totally voluntary for them too. Uh, but they would come and we'd have good times of discussion, got to know them, got to know their families. You know, it was interesting because, you know, being there all the time, I thought, well, it's, it's a team chaplain situation, but it opened up to where, I mean, there were police officers working security. They would come up sometimes and talk to me and, you know, they'd say, can you pray for my mother? She's, you know, and it just, it opened up to where I realized that the, the mission field there was much bigger than the locker room, obviously. And, uh, you know, it was a good time. Got to know a lot of people. Got to meet quite a few people. Of course, you know, Pat Summit is, you know, on the other end of the locker room, you know, with her team. And got to meet a lot of them as well and spent some time there, um, you know, uh, let's see. So, you know, athletes will come through like crazy. And, you know, uh, Terrell Owens, you know, he's walking down the the, um, the corridor to the locker room. And I stop and talk to him. and. You know, they were playing the SEC, so you had a lot of Kentucky players. So a lot of guys that went to the NBA were coming through those doors. And so it was just, you know, it was fun. It was really good. But most important, it just really, you know, expanded my uh, vision of, of what they need, man. That, that that whole sports industry is tough, man, because it's easy for them to build walls around themselves and not be touched by people. And sometimes when you build those walls, you end up keeping out some people that you need to have in your life, you know, and they just got to – they've got to preserve their life. But – Sometimes they end up getting it so small they don't have uh, access to some of the things they really need. And uh, so that was interesting to watch, you know, just to be able to be in that um, in that realm. That was that was really impressive. Yeah, so you, enjoyed that. Yeah, I mean, you became a part of the team pretty much when you're – Yeah, in many ways, yeah. And uh, to the point where family members, their, their parents who lived in other parts of the country would call me with, you know, concerns they had or, or issues they wanted me to, to talk with their young people about or whatever. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, it was eye opening in, in many ways, and I, I enjoyed it for sure. Where did you get to uh, sit up close to the bench or anything, or where did? You- uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was. I kind of stayed in the tunnel, you know. I kind of just stayed out there, uh, just in case whatever would happen, you know, and was available, you know, for whatever. Yeah. Um, I traveled. I didn't travel, quote unquote, with the team, but I would go, you know, to some the road trips. I went down to the SEC tournament, just made myself available um, yeah. at the hotel or wherever. 
uh, just it was just amazing. Sometimes people just, you know, some of the players or coaches or whatever just come up and start talking. And, you know, everybody, here's what I found. Everybody's going through something, right? Every single person. Everybody you meet at Chick-fil-A, at Kroger, at the spa guy, wherever you are, everybody's going through something. And if you just will, will just hang out for a minute with the person and you're genuine, they'll oftentimes say, you know, you know how it goes. How you doing? And the girl behind the counter says, I'm doing fine. And you just, if you'll just ask one extra question, how are you really doing? And they look at you and she'll be like, well, be honest. You know, I just got some bad news or my mom just got some bad news. And next thing you know, somebody who was fine is is glad for you to pray for. And uh, and so the whole world's our mission field in that, in that regard. So that happened a lot there as well. I enjoyed it. It was a good time. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Did did uh, uh Buzz did Buzz ever talk to the team about Michael or any of his times at North Carolina? Well, sometimes you know you sometimes hear some of those stories. Uh, I would, you know, I would he, Buzz could probably use Michael as a motivation. Yeah, motivation, yeah, yeah. And it was weird to be sitting there like at Buzz's house or wherever, and, and, uh, and he, the phone would ring. He looked at it and said, "It's Mike. I got to take right. this." And I was kind of offended, obviously, because hey, I'm sitting right here, pal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> surreal. You wanted to get that phone to pray with Mike, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I thought it was twelve and a half now. <laughs> cool, you know, I'm friends with Michael's friend, uh, David Bridgers, that grew up with okay. him in uh, Wilmington, and uh, I've uh, DB had Michael's phone number, and I okay. saw Michael's phone number, and I'm thinking, like, this is so cool. Now, I would never do anything with it because that's why Michael has to change his phone every few months because True. people like that so find out his number. Yeah. But, man, it was so cool to see M, M in there, MJ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was no, thinking we right. would use that as motivation. I'm sure, hey, you know, I played with Michael mm-hmm. Jordan, and this is what Michael Jordan did. So if you all want to be an NBA. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were one person removed. And, of course, we both know uh, Randy Shepard uh, with Crossfire Ministries. He's also friends with both of them and came out of the Asheville area and Randy, actually was from uh, Randy Billy is the guy that ran into me and you. Oh, the basketball guy. Week with the globe trotting basketball. Yeah, that was it was spent. Okay, yeah, we met him. Yeah. David and Randy and you now, know, where did we see him at? Where were we at? It was at El- the Elvis Candlelight Vigil. That's right. But we saw him in New what was it, New Orleans? No. Did we see him somewhere else? No. Okay. We saw Yeah, him. you're right. He was at the Candlelight Vigil. He, he was, was spinning praying. the ball. Right. Yeah. You know, doing prayers with people. Ed. Yeah. Yeah. While we're recording this, he's actually in the Philippines. He takes teams all over the world and they do, they put on these demonstrations. They play, you know, these games uh, with local teams and kind of like the Globetrotters. Uh, you know, they're really good because they always play together and they pretty much are able to black out whoever they play. We should have mm-hmm. him. We should have him on there one night. Me, you, David, and the spy guy. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, because I could take them to the bucket, man. We yeah, need to we need to play we need to play a little b ball with them, you know. Take them down, show them how it's done. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I've taken a few snaps. Yeah. With the uh, basketball team. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we going, well, you know, David? I, I shouldn't argue with somebody who is an NFL owner. I probably should not argue sports. That, that. and that is factual, friends. Um, uh, I am an owner of. The um, Milwaukee, no, where is it, David? Uh, the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> I am, in fact, a owner of a part owner of the Green Bay Packers. That's not, I'm not being funny. That is a fact. <laughs> it is, a, but it's a funny fact. It is a fun. It's funny the fact that I am an owner of the Green Bay Packers. Cheesehead. But that is still a fact. I am a cheesehead. A lot of people have said that about me. That didn't know that I was the owner of the Green Bay Packers, ironically. Right, right, right. Now they know, Spy Guy. Yeah. <laughs> so that, let me ask you this, David. You work with Billy, and you've been working with Billy. Don't for, rub it in. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you've been working with Billy for a long time. You know, it, it, it's really funny. Uh, every now and then, I'll, I'll get on our YouTube stuff, and I'll I'll see I'll see some kind of comment talking about how uh, a terrible guy that that Spy Guy is. And then he, I, I'll laugh because I'll automatically know, well, this fella don't even know who the Billy is. He's probably listening to the 
other person down the road that listened to somebody else that listened to somebody else with lies. But like, Billy, you have so many people that think that you're just a bad guy. Like, you know, so what is it like working with this terrible uh, spa guy over here? Uh, well, yeah. And there's only really one way to deliver this uh, truth that I'm about to tell you. And that is to, to emulate one of the more popular voices in the American culture. Billy's a great guy, just a terrific guy. I can't stand him, okay? I can't stand him, but he's a terrific guy. He's phenomenal. He knows more about really anything than anybody, except, of course, me. Yeah, I know a little more than Billy, but, but he's great. Don't get me wrong. He's a good, he built this whole hot, he had this pool business or whatever he's got. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. A lot of people are helped by this guy. I don't understand it, but he's a great guy. Uh, I would probably vote for him if I wasn't running. So he's a <laughs> terrific guy. Sometimes, you know, sometimes he uh, he gets on my nerves, but then the payday, I feel great about it. He's a terrific <laughs> guy on payday. Uh, he signs the checks, and uh, hey, you know, he that's actually up. not true, David. Lori signs the checks. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a terrific person too. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but Billy knew the new Elvis person. A lot of people don't know that. Billy played in his band for a long time. Look it up on YouTube, people. Some of y'all are gonna believe that. I know you will. <laughs> those are those are people that are that are wishing God was wishing a monkey. God was a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> now Billy's Billy's a good guy. He's been a good guy to me. I'm on his show right now, so what am I gonna say? Thanks a lot, Troy. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You backed him right <laughs> in a corner. <laughs> David, no, I mean, you're a testament. You've been working with yeah. – how long have you worked with Billy? Uh, since 2015, so like 2000, eight years. So yeah. eight years, and you're still working yeah. with my guy? It seems like longer than that, man. That, that's – I mean, David, I mean, you, you're like, still – For him, it seems longer. Uh, it seems like it should be longer than that. Uh, but for me, it seems like it should be shorter than that. But think, yeah. I mean, think about that, David. I mean, eight years, you're still working with the spy yeah. guy. You haven't locked him out of no building, and your business is still in operation. Because I don't have a key, Jack. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, the fact that he still kept me, because I knew nothing about hot tubs coming in. Um, and I, I still know very little. Uh, but uh, David you know, does so a great he, job. Really great and he learned, learned from zero, from knowing nothing about it, to... I mean, he handles uh, – I don't have to deal with hot tub covers anymore. He handles all that. He had, He takes a lot of stuff off of me where I don't even have to think about it anymore. Well, David, knowing the spy guy like I know him uh, with filming yeah. and stuff, uh, if you were not good at your job, you probably wouldn't be around. That's probably safe to say. That is right? very safe to say, yes. Yeah, yeah he, you know, I he, have no issues with firing people. That's, you really you know, I fired somebody like – it hasn't been that long ago. Everybody knows you have to fire people. Uh, almost yeah, hey, as much. This as is how Trump. I wish I could impersonate him like you do, but he would go, "You're fired." You remember that? It's yes. like a cobra. You're fired. <laughs> you're fired. You're a great guy. I wish you could stay around, but you're fired. <laughs> you're fired. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, mean, I don't take. Know, okay, so Billy's intense. All right, in case you haven't noticed, basically whatever Billy goes after, he goes after 110 percent. Right. And um, and he thinks a lot of his ability, and and that's because he's been given a lot of abilities. All right, some people are just in some ways, whatever he touches on certain issues, it's, it just happens. Okay, for instance, he's very um, he's mechanically inclined. Okay, so he can see something that's supposed to work a certain way as a mechanical thing, and he can break it down, look at it, figure out what's wrong, put it back together. Not, I'm not that way. Like I can learn things along the way but I'm not mechanically inclined to take something apart, figure out what's wrong, put it back together and watch it run. So he, he's very, he's a troubleshooter. He likes to see things work. And so he goes all in and that's that he's all in. Okay. So there's obviously um, everybody's got their issues. His issue is he's all in. And sometimes that, that holds you back from other areas, but sometimes, boy, I've, I've tried one away, I've, but that's all right. I've Go seen ahead. people leave and I've, I've never seen him leave that fast. Uh, but, you know, when there's just, you're all in. And so there's things that come with that. And, you know, when you're all in, you make mistakes. Because, like, it's like being in a car, okay? Some people are windshields and some people are rear bumpers. And the rear bumpers never catch any insects because they're at the back. They're the last thing to get through. They're late adopters. The ones on the front, man, you know, you're just constantly moving forward. And uh, you just got to deal with it. 
Yeah. But yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I like to uh, to constantly be moving forward and be working towards something. I'm always working towards something. Yeah. And um, and I I enjoy it. It's the you know I hate to clo- quote Miley Cyrus, but it's the climb. You know, it's the fun of <laughs> of having a something that you're going after, something that you're trying to aspire to, and that's that's right. And it's fun. And uh, man, I <laughs> love being able to. Um, create things that's why i really like making videos because it's 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 that outlet it's something that i can do that i can tell a story you like to tell stories and you're a preacher i like to tell stories i like to to invoke stories especially if it's something interesting something heartfelt that kind of stuff so i think that's important so let's talk about um you know you mentioned before and trey will be back shortly but you mentioned before um, several different famous people that you had met. You know, you mentioned some famous football players, basketball players, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Tell us about some of the other uh, famous people that you have had an opportunity to meet and that kind of stuff. I know there's, I know there's some stories yeah, there. For sure. Um, so there's, there's uh, one of the ones that's kind of impressed me the most was I was part of a, a focus group and they had brought, people in from different industries into um, kind of brainstorm a new project. And they needed some people to facilitate tables of these influencers. And so I was at a table and around this table were probably seven or eight people. And uh, there were people there from a lot of different industries, CEOs and, and you know, business people. And uh, so we go around the table and you're supposed to introduce yourself and tell you what, tell people what you do. And so it started out over here. This guy, he's told his name. He started telling about the business that he started and he runs and blah, blah, blah. He's telling all this stuff. And then it goes to the next guy and he tells his name. He starts telling about how great his business is and the things he's accomplished. And they're they're not being ugly about it. They're just, they're proud of themselves. You know, they've accomplished some things. Gets to about the fourth person and the guy says, uh, uh, my name's Ricky and I play music. And it was Ricky Skaggs. And that's all he said about himself. You know what I mean? (laughs) It was yeah. like the most understated thing. So nobody knew who any of the other people at the table were. And they were going on and on and on because they had to commit you who they were. And yeah. they just him and says, my name's Rick. He didn't even give his last name. And he says, and I play music. And that was it for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it just, I was sitting there and everybody was sitting there going, wow. The guy who could have <laughs> taken all day to tell us and we would have all sat here and loved it. Uh, he just said his name was Rick and he plays music. Yeah. And uh, that, that was uh that was an interesting moment for me to just remind me, you know, don't ever take yourself too seriously. Don't get your big head, you know, because you don't know who else is at the table. And of course, that day we all knew who was at the table. I don't know if everybody else was trying to impress him or what, but yeah, it was it was really a, a strange moment because the first few people they were sitting there like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really well, he's awful. uh, you know, we interacted with him, and I know you did too at the bridge. Yeah. And uh, a lot of bridge functions and that kind of stuff. And he was always a very nice man. And of course he's a, yeah. in the bluegrass, I mean, he's, he's a superstar, yeah. you know, in the bluegrass realm and in the country yeah. re- realm and, and uh, what a, uh, a nice, humble man and a Christian man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Genuinely. So, you know, and yeah, very open yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that, that, that's, and those are the moments that should tell us who we are because, um, that's that's probably how Jesus worked, you know. He just uh, he wasn't here to impress anybody. He was just here to, to be who he was supposed to be. But uh, that was interesting. Job. That was inspiring to me. And um, then another one. Uh, <laughs> so I was uh, I was at a funeral. Somebody in our church had a family member that had passed away, and uh, this lady was African American, and it was her niece. And so I took my my church member. I took her to the funeral. I didn't know the niece that had passed away. But we got there, and, and basically in this funeral home, there were a lot of folks, and I was one of only about three or four white people there, which is fine with me. You know, it doesn't matter. And so the funeral is going on, and, and it gets to a point where at the end, um, I walk out, and I'm kind of leaving the family to, to be with, them, you know, with each other. And, and I get to the top of the driveway, and when I get up there, one of the other white people was standing up there at the top of the driveway. And um, so we start talking, and it's just a short lady. Hey, he's back. Nice you to be back with us, Trey. He really is globetrotting. 
<laughs> He's locked up again. Go ahead, David. Um, so, so we're standing there talking, and we start talking about how we knew the um, the person who had passed away. And turns out that I didn't know the person who passed away at all, but this lady knew her because that young lady had been a worker in her house. So we're talking, 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 and finally, my my church member comes out. We go to the vehicle, and we get in, and um, so we get in the vehicle and she goes, how, how was your talk? She had seen me up there talking to that other white lady, older white lady. And, uh, I said, it was fine. She goes, uh, what Miss Brenda had to say? I said, who is she? And she goes, Miss Brenda. I said, Brenda, who? She goes, Brenda Lee. And she I was, was just there, talking to. <laughs> and I didn't even, I'm like, Growing up, my dad and mom loved her music, and I knew her from the songs, but I just, she was a lot shorter <laughs> in person than yeah, I had. Yeah, she's tiny. Never, yeah. yeah, and I just never expected to see her there, and so it's not one of my most you know favorite people because I didn't, like, it wasn't my generation. And then I'm sitting there going, I was just chatting with Brenda Lee, and she must have either thought I was the dumbest person in Nashville for not knowing who she was, or I was the most gracious person for not pointing out who she was. <laughs> Cause uh, that was one of those moments where it's like, I was talking to somebody who was famous. I didn't know it. But then when I was, uh, you know, I was told who it was. I'm like, well, that's one of the most famous voices in American history. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and David, everybody loves her. You know, that jingle, nobody does it like Brenda Lee. <laughs> exactly right. right? Nobody does it like Brenda Lee. That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> That's right. See, everybody loves know, Brenda Lee. Like everybody like, everybody yeah. loves it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> <laughs> and what was her, uh, it was Rock Around the Christmas Tree was her. Yes. Her famous and I hit. Want a, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas, right? Yeah. Did she do that one too? So yeah. a very unique voice. Now, if she'd have been singing, I'd have recognized her right off. Yeah, of but, course. Uh, super short. Yeah, was, yeah, so that's like the most famous person that I didn't know I was talking to, which is kind of weird. But yeah, and but she, it's, it's she's a big. What's her Elvis tie, Trey? Yeah, Brenda Lee. Elvis attended her concerts in Vegas, or she attended. It was something like that. Something like that. Yeah, and the bus. You know, I mentioned on another <laughs> podcast that I worked with um, uh, Don Cox. Um, it's from North Carolina. Don's bus was Brenda Lee's bus that we traveled on. And, uh, it was her old, her old Eagle. And, uh, so there's all kinds of Brenda Lee ties. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty cool. Sure. Yeah. But I love that jingle. Nobody does it like Brenda That's, Lee. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Makes me hungry now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and the thing is, it was like set up to where, there must have been 150 uh, black skin folks, and there was like four of us white skin folks. I still couldn't figure out who she was. Yes. You know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> what unbelievable. She probably got in her car with her. You know, there must have been like her some relatives she had traveled with. She probably got in the car, and they said, well, what was that all about? Did he just kind of wear you out trying to get your autographs? And she's like, he never even mentioned who I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, that's hilarious! But, that's funny yeah. stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, okay, so Trey, I'm sorry, man. I don't know what's going on with your setup, but wow. Yeah, Did bad. you buy your computer at, at uh, Family Dollar? Um, the internet, my internet just drops out. I don't know what's going on. It's freezing everything. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's that disc. You got to put that disc back in and run yeah. that program to get the internet. Yeah, back. that AOL. You're an American <laughs> offline. You know, um, I used to have internet like that, and then my data got a job. That one was coming, David. Yeah. yeah. Working right now. So I, I hear that four times a day, Trey. <laughs> oh, okay. It yeah. works for so many things. So, okay. So I was in, uh, I was in Texas and, uh, it was 19, 19- 88 somewhere yeah it's 1988 okay so the presidential campaign was rolling okay and al gore was running for president in 88 um so was dukakis i believe and some of those other guys so this was a, a political you know campaign stop and so they're all coming out and and of course 1988 security was not as strong as it is now obviously they're coming down this corridor and there's all these people with you know cameras and little uh, mini cassettes trying to get these little interviews and stuff and I had a video camera, and it was in my left hand. 
of course it was one of those huge personal video cameras you know it had a i actually had a, a vcr hanging from a strap on yes. my side that the camera plugged into right and trey's going what are you talking about yeah that's, <laughs> that's back in the day <laughs> that? so all of a sudden they're, they're working their way down and i'm just standing there and i'm looking for my opportunity <laughs> and i said hello mr gore my name is david but you can't hear me say my name is david all you hear is al gore reach out and shake my hand and you can't see me but you can't hear me and he just reached out and goes hey david how you doing <laughs> so it, it looks like he knew who i was <laughs> and he called me out <laughs> only because that's how the video came out not because he actually <laughs> did oh, so crazy. yeah that's uh yeah so there again I, I i get to meet somebody famous and it act they act like they knew who i am so that's all good that is and you know uh speaking of if you want to go political you and i went and actually met with uh, someone that is in politics today and you asked him something yes but you want to talk about that yeah for sure that was a ted cruz rally i think it was in franklin maybe right? it was in franklin yeah. and um he 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 uh, gave his speech and he came back and he was sitting down signing autographs or something he was sitting at a table and people were coming by getting a sh handshake and uh and i told him at the time i said uh you know if you become president you should do what you can to abolish abortion, make it illegal. And uh, he looked up at me, you know, he's he's looking around all of a sudden, he looks up at me right in my eyes and he says, I'll do that. You know, I'll, I'll make that a priority. And so, uh, you know. I have that, I filmed that. You that moment, yeah, it's all when video, that happened. Yeah. I, feel, I was standing sure. there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah he so. did say that. And, uh, yeah. you know, he that was very, you very important. You could see him stop, you know, like, you know how it is, but you yeah. could see him stop. Like, he was literally listening to what I said. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there was like a frenzy in this room, and then suddenly it was like, boop. That's that, right. really, that was something that really, really caught his attention. Yeah. And, uh, and, and luckily, since then, there has mm -hmm. been a move to, right. uh, on some That's level, right. to, to stop that atrocity. Right. And, yep. um, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 They kept saying that if we overturn Roe v. Wade, you know, so many women will die and stuff. Look, it ain't happening. It's just it was, a lie from me, the if, devil. If, That's what we, he if does. They he were, trust, they'd be on the news every night if they were, you know, because that they make sure that it's just not, it's not true. But we also Play saw you. Rubio. Play that very much. that means we have three minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, have you got. So I've got one Elvis. All right. All right. Go ahead. So the first, I grew up in Moorhead. The first, um, the first concert, like real, real concert, I went to, I went to the Greenville uh, Elk Lodge, and a Moose Lodge. Moose Lodge. Was I've it. played at that Moose Lodge. Right. Mm -hmm. I saw Milo Lefevre in Broken Heart. Milo Lefevre played there, uh, and that was the first like real concert, like big time concert I went to. And of course, I didn't know it at the time, but now I, I know looking back, his connection with Elvis. And without him and all those good songs that he wrote and his family. Uh, so that was, that's kind of my, I reckon that's my Elvis connection with uh, music. So I met Milo Lefebvre that night. That's very cool. I was like probably 11 or 12 years old, man. Yeah, that was a big deal too, wasn't it? Yeah, because that would have been like 80, 82, somewhere in there. Yeah, I guess. yeah my dad's brother, uh, Uncle Ed, that lived in Greenville, was uh, heavily involved in that Moose Lodge. And okay. my band would play at that Moose Lodge. And uh, I remember okay. it being off of, uh, well, it's been a long time. Uh, it was off of the road that, that heads to the airport, to the hospital. It was on there. It's kind of a, a weird intersection there. And it's in the middle of that intersection, kind of a uh, behind a place that sold uh, tombstones, believe it or not, <laughs> that sits at a big intersection. But yeah, I've been there many, 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 many times, uh, many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny yeah. that both of you guys are North Carolinians or however y'all say it. Linians. Linians. North let's, let's get it right. North Carolina, North Carolinians. Carolinians. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but y'all ended up in Nashville or outside of Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. At different times. Mm -hmm. That's right. For different reasons. That's right. Mm -hmm. Different reason. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yep. you know, I've always liked you, David. Uh, times that I've hung out uh, with you and a spa guy during your busy days selling parts that y'all do. I don't know how y'all <laughs> do the truth. That's yeah. I mean, wow. 
you 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 probably package something and turn around and ten more things have come in during the time yeah. that you wrap the box uh, to ship that out. Probably that's how it works, right? That's, that's exactly happening right. right now. On Monday, we shipped. Was it? Uh, it was two hundred twenty orders somewhere there thereabouts. Yeah. And yeah. um, that and that when it's this time of the year, man, they come in. Literally, you clear everything and. In 10 minutes, you look and there's something else to ship and it's just never ending, which I'm yeah. thankful for. You know, we're sure. we're very, very blessed uh, that the Lord has given us the ability to have something that we can kind of, um, you know, it's almost like I'm going to tell. Can I tell something weird? I've always had this uh, this thing where I thought it would be cool to be kind of like in a mall inside of a box where you can interact with people, but they never see you. You know what I'm saying? But you're kind of like a, you're inside a robot, but they never know. But right. that's kind of what we do, you know, <laughs> like this where, you know, when I'm dealing with customers and shipping parts, I'm interacting with people, but I don't ever have to really interact with them. And I know that sounds weird, but that's, I like that aspect of it. I'm not, you know, I'm, Oh, I, I, I'm trying to, uh, turn my duties of answering the phone and stuff over to other people. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm older now and, uh, don't <laughs> like to, <laughs> there's a, there's some days I don't care about interacting. Let's just say hey, that. My favorite one was we're going to Biloxi, right? And some guy called Billy about some kind of part or whatever. And like Billy was trying to explain to this fellow. We probably shouldn't tell this, Trey. But it's, <laughs> was, this was funny for me, you know. And uh, so like Billy's trying to explain uh, what the guy needs, you know. And I guess the guy on the other end was just not having it. He was trying to explain to Billy. And so Billy finally <laughs> cut him out and said, listen here, fella. Did I call you or did you call me? <laughs> Sure. I'm, just talking right here. I'm telling you it's this did you watch my video i did the video i sent you the video you didn't watch it did you? <laughs> you no. stuff like you get that all the time right <laughs> well i mean the thing is is it, it trips me out when somebody calls and asks you you know hey i don't know about this tell me about this and then you start telling them about it and then they start trying to correct you you know and and <laughs> Billy, yeah. did you call me or did I call you? <laughs> well, well, hey, I'm guilty as charged. I've, I've said it was that. funny though. How you said it was so funny. <laughs> like, you know, I don't remember calling you. <laughs> that's exactly. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I was just sitting here minding my own business, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you called me and asked me, but I tell you, uh, friends, uh, and we're running way over, but. But I can tell you this, David and I and Trey have to all interact with the public at large, and we should all be very, very, very concerned. I'll say that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> well, guys, this was fun uh, reminiscing about different stuff. We'll have to do it again uh, uh, soon, yeah. David. I, uh, I know you got a lot more stories to tell, and I and. I, I like uh, joking around, and I think it. I think it was a a, a nice little mix up, and um, especially you know, part with Trey. Hey, David, you actually have a YouTube show too. Yeah, let's I talk do. about that. That's that's right, Trey. You did some videos when uh when uh, Billy had the ambulance at the location, and y'all uh, he cleaned it out, cleaned it off, and everything. And yeah. I think you filmed some videos that had like a hundred thousand views. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, tell them about yeah. your channel and how to find it. Yeah, my channel is um, Good Stuff Videos on YouTube. Good Stuff Videos. That's just it, man. Um, and it's just a variety show, really. To be honest with you, I've got stuff about Elvis and the ambulance. And I just went over 1.25 million views for all my videos. And uh, so enjoying that. And just stuff that I find interesting or informative or whatever. So uh, funny stuff. Think, at least I think it's funny sometimes. But uh, you guys are kind of setting the pace for that because I'm, I'm a slacker a lot of times. I don't get enough content up there. But I'm working on that, so I'll, I'll get some more things up for sure. That's enjoyable. 1.2, think about it, 1.2 million views, and you didn't steal any content. It was your own film. Yeah. Think about that. <laughs> that and hey, look, you're going to put stuff from Kenya up as well, right? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's right. So that's cool. Yeah. I'm looking yeah, forward but, to you know, seeing all that. When I think about how many people have spent that many hours and hours and years watching my stuff, it explains why we have so many problems out there in our culture. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly right. Well, on that note, I'm going to say nobody does it like Sarah Lee. Yeah. Yeah.